Hello, and welcome to the second part of our introductory training, Control Flow. In the previous episode, you learned about the basics of UI path, variables, and how actions are contained inside flowcharts or sequences. If you don't yet have a firm understanding of these basic concepts, make sure you watch the previous training again, because today we'll dive deeper into the mechanics of UI path, specifically Control Flow. Control flow is the process of defining the rules and automatic decisions your workflow will take through the use of if-else decisions, loops, and so on. So, without much further ado, let's start with probably the most important piece of computer programming, the if-else decision. You've seen it briefly mentioned in the previous training, but this time we're going to try it out. Actually, we're going to do the same example twice, because the if-else decision is one of the very few that has two virtually identical activities, one for the flowchart mode and one for the sequence mode. They may look different, but they work exactly the same by taking one of the two different actions based on a specific condition. That may sound a bit more complicated than it actually is. So, let's see a simple example. We'll make a workflow that checks if a certain year is a leap year or not. It does that by testing if the specific year is a multiple of four. So, starting with a blank project, we'll first drag in a flowchart, like we learned in the previous training. We'll name this Master Flowchart. It will help us keep things organized. Then, we'll add another flowchart inside it, connect it to the Start node, and double-click to edit. And it's a good idea to name this one too. That's it for the setting up part. Now to the real automation. First, we need to create a new variable to hold our specific year. For that, go to the Variables pane and create a new variable called year. Since it will hold a number, we'll change the type from string to integer and also give it a value of 2013 for testing. Now, because we are in a flowchart, we'll drag in the flow decision action and not the if action. How do we test if a number is a multiple of four? There are a few options, but the easiest is the modulus operator. It works by giving us the remainder of a division operation. In case you forgot that piece of math, the remainder is the number left over after dividing one integer by another. So, to see if a number is a multiple of four, we can look at the remainder. If it's zero, the number is a multiple of four, which means it's a leap year. Coming back to our flowchart, first connect the decision node to the start node. And in the condition field, we'll put year, the variable we created earlier. Mod four, equals zero, and that's it. Now add a new message box action by dragging it from the left pane and connect it to the decision node. This being the situation when the year is a multiple of four, we'll just say this is a leap year and drag another message box. But this time don't drop it yet. Hover over the decision box and drop it on this bluish arrow. It means it will automatically connect here for this one, we'll display this one isn't. So, let's review. The program starts from the start node and goes to the decision box. Here, if the variable year that we defined earlier is a multiple of four, it will display this message box. And if not, this other box. When we run, we see the year 2013 is not a leap year. And that 2016 is. Since we don't want to change this variable by hand every time, we'll just add an input dialog by dragging it on this wire before the decision. This inserts the action between the two. This is what an empty input dialog does. Not much, just gives you an empty field where we can type. We can customize its properties here, and for starters, we'll change the label to please enter year in quotations. All text strings are in quotations. What the input field does is it takes the value of what a user types and outputs it to a variable. Since we already have a variable defined, we'll just put its name here, or just the first few letters, because the rest of the name autocompletes. Now, although at the very start of this program, the value in the year variable was 2016, after the input dialog, its new value will be whatever we type in the empty field. So, if we put in 2015, we'll see that this one isn't a leap year. And this one is. Great. And finally, let's give these some meaningful names and correct this spelling mistake.
So that's how the decision node, message box, and input dialog work. Now, let's quickly recreate this exact behavior in a sequence so that you can see what that's like. So, just go to the master flow chart by clicking here, drag in a new sequence, and give it an appropriate name. We'll do almost the same steps. First, add the input dialog and create the year variable by right-clicking in the output field. It's a bit faster and change its type to integer. Unlike before, this time drag in an if block and drop it in the sequence. For the condition, we'll put the same thing as before, year mod 4 equals 0. Also, add a couple of message boxes for the true and false situations and type the same messages as before. As you can see, the sequence if is very similar to the flowchart decision node. The notable difference is that the if action is more suitable for small pieces of automation, because there's only so much that you can fit in the tiny then and else boxes. Although technically, you could drop in a container, like a flowchart or sequence, and have a whole process in there. But the decision node is more suitable for this kind of higher level decisions, business choices and so on. Don't worry, you'll start to get a feel for the subtle difference between the two once you start automating more complex projects. But for that, you'll also need loops. Loops are structures most often used to automate repetitive tasks. Since repeating similar operations without making errors is a core function of automation and programming in general, loops are an essential element in most projects. In UiPath, there are a few methods for repeating certain tasks. The simplest is available in flowchart mode, and it involves connecting a certain point in our flowchart to an earlier execution point. And in sequence mode, there are looping containers that repeat the actions there are inside their body section. In our flowchart, let's just say we want to start the process again when we haven't found a leap year. To do that, we'll just connect the end of this branch of the workflow to where we want the execution to resume. Now, when the program reaches this message box, it will go to the start of the program and ask us again to input a number. But if the number is a leap year, the program chooses the true branch of the workflow and the execution will stop after the message box. As you can see, it's pretty easy to make a loop in a flowchart simply by connecting a wire to a previous execution point. Just make sure there's also an exit option out of the loop, otherwise your automation will be forever stuck in that loop. So, that's how looping works in flowchart mode. In a sequence, there are another couple of options, the do while loops and for each. It's pretty clear that the while and do while loops are almost the same thing. They work by repeating the set of actions in the body while the condition is true. The only difference between the two is the order in which the two elements are executed. For the while loop, if the condition is met, the set of actions in the body are executed. For the do while loop, the actions are executed and then, if the condition is met, the actions are executed again. The for each loop is a bit different. It works by iterating through a list of items, one item at a time, and executing whatever actions are in the body of the action. But let's see some examples of this. Coming back to our sequence leap year workflow, let's modify this example to repeatedly ask for a number until you enter a leap year, or a number that's a multiple of four. We already have most of it, we just want to repeat it until we get it right. So all we have to do is put all this inside a do while loop, and we're done. So, let's drag one inside the sequence, it doesn't really matter where, and then move the two existing actions inside the loop. You can select both of them using the control key. The do while block got a bit bigger to accommodate the new actions, but it's still the same. Now, we just need to enter a new condition for when this whole sequence will execute again. And that will be when our year variable is not a multiple of four. So, we'll just copy condition from the if statement and use for the while condition and change it to be not equal. By the way, this is the symbol for not equal. So now when we run the workflow, the process stops only when we enter a leap year.
In our case, the do while action was preferable, but other situations might require the other while loop with a condition before the action. Right, I guess that's all pretty straightforward. So let's take a quick look at the for each loop that we mentioned earlier. We'll use it to cycle through all the files in a chosen folder and print out their name one by one. Easy enough. In practice, you would probably do more advanced stuff than simply printing their name, but now we're just testing the for each loop. We'll start by adding a new sequence into the master workflow. And inside it, add a select folder action. It's just an input dialog that will let us choose a specific folder and then create a new output variable by right clicking and choosing create variable. We'll name it selected folder. Then we'll drop in an assign action. On the left, create a new variable called files list. We want to get a list of files and there's a special command for that. Directory.getFiles and the folder's path is a parameter. In our case, we'll just use the one generated by the select folder action. Because the getFiles command generates a list or an array of files, the type of variable must be an array of strings. Finally, add the for each loop and fill in the list with our list of files. This way, for each item in our list, we'll do some action. In this case, a simple right line for each individual item. It looks like we'll also have to convert it to string. So now, if we run the automation, it will first ask us to select the folder, then UiPath will read that folder, and using this .NET piece of code, it will give us a list of files, and we store this list in our variable, named simply files list. And then this loop will go through each item in the list, which in our case is a file path, and print it to the output window. And here they are. Good. We covered quite a few things in this video, so let's try a new exercise that will tie together all the new things that we've learned. We want to automate a kid's guessing game. The computer chooses a random number between 0 and 1000, and we'll try to guess it. It will respond with hints, like higher and lower, depending on if your guess was smaller or larger than the random number, and so on until you get it right. So we could break it down to this. First, generate a random number between 0 and 1000. Then, have the user guess the number. If the guess was correct, respond with a message and stop and if not, respond with higher or lower depending on the user's guess. Then, repeat the whole process if the user guessed wrong. So, back in our master flowchart, let's add a new flowchart and name it Guessing Game. Connect it to the start node so that it'll be the one that actually runs and double click it to edit. Let's start with the hardest part, generating a random number. We'll do that by assigning to it a new variable called random. This value, new, random, dot next between 0 and 1000. It's a dot net command that you can easily find if you type into Google, something like dot net random number. Okay, so now that you have the only missing piece of the puzzle, you can stop the video and try solving it yourself. If you need to, rewind the video for hints. Then, after you're done, you can resume the video and see how we did it, and compare. Okay, moving on with our solution. Now that we have our random number, we need to ask the user to guess it. We'll go ahead and add a new input dialog and fill in the title and label. And the important part, the output variable. We'll create a new one called guess. Now that we have the random number and the user's guess, we'll add a decision node and test whether the guess was correct. So, for the condition, we'll put guess equals random. For the true branch, add a message box saying that it was correct. Now, for the false branch, we have to output two different messages, depending on a condition. So, drag in another decision node and connect it to the false branch of this decision node. For the condition, we'll put guess is less than random. This way, we'll know which hint to display. 
We could have two different messages for the true and false branches of the decision, but then you'd have two message boxes one after the other, one of the two hints and then the input dialog. Here's a more elegant solution. We'll create a new variable using an assign action and store it in the hint. So right click, new variable, we'll name it hint, and the hint for the true branch is guess a bigger number. And for the other, guess a smaller number. Now we'll connect these two assigned blocks to the input box. This way, if you guessed higher or lower than the correct number, the process will start again from the input dialog. There's one last thing to do, and that is change the display message from the current what's the number question to the hint we generated here. So we'll just put here hint. Now when we run the workflow, the message box has no text, and that's because the hint variable doesn't yet have a value. But after the first guess, the hint is initialized and displayed. We could easily solve that by giving it an initial value, but I'll leave it to you. That's all for this episode of Control Flow. As a second exercise, try creating the guessing game that we just made, but in a sequence. It should be fairly easy with what you've learned today. And make sure you tune in for the next episode, Recording, where you'll see how UiPath generates a lot of the work for you. I'll see you then. Goodbye.